This episode of I Am Salt Lake Podcast is proudly sponsored by Jed's Barbershop. With three locations, you have no reason to not always look your best. Go get a haircut, a beard trim, or even a straight razor shave. Jed's Barbershop is open seven days a week, Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. to 9 p.m., Saturday, 9 to 7, and Sunday, 12 to 5. Their newest location is located at 167 East, 900 South, right next to Randy's Records. They also have a location downtown at 212 South, 700 East, and up in Sugar House at 2153 East, 2100 South. No appointment is necessary. Just show up, get yourself a haircut. Maybe you have a uh, last-minute date or a job interview. Jed's Barbershop is the place for you. Head on over to their website at jedsbarbershop.com for more information. Showcasing local talent, professionals, and everyday people making Salt Lake City what it is today. It's time for another episode of the I Am Salt Lake podcast. All right, I want to welcome everybody out today to episode 299 of I Am Salt Lake podcast. My name's Chris Hollifield. And I'm Chrissy Hollifield. Today on the podcast, we chat with Andrea Smartin. Andrea is the host and producer of Changing Our Stories podcast and former reporter at KUER 90.1. We get into all of this in this episode. We find out what got her interested in working for public radio, what it was like, and why she left to pursue her own podcast. Because she's talented and she does an amazing job. It's a, it's a great <laughs> podcast. It is a great podcast. And we're going to get into all of that here. Uh, we're going to play that conversation here in just a minute. As always, if this is your first time listening to the podcast, make sure to head on over to our website at IamSaltLake.com. This is where you can find the entire back episodes of the podcast. You can listen to them right there. Also, there are links to subscribe to the podcast in uh, iTunes, Stitcher, places like that. Uh, so you can, you know don't miss a single episode. We've got a new episode that comes out every week. We've been Yeah, we're, we're in every player that you use. We've been chatting with some great people here, Chrissy. We really have. And you can learn a lot about Salt Lake by just checking out these episodes, too. Like I said, this is episode 299. So you do the calculations of how many conversations <laughs> that we've had here on the podcast. Hey, but listen up. We all run into those events that we need a photographer Maybe it's a family get together. If you got a work holiday party, if you're a comedian that needs headshots, or maybe you're like Chrissy and myself, we needed a wedding photographer. We needed a good wedding photographer. We want to invite you to check out the photography of a local photographer, Amanda DeWolf. She took all of our wedding pictures, and I know I seriously couldn't be any happier with how they came out. She made us look like models. She really did. Yeah. Her website, AmandaKMemories.com, is where you can get in touch, see her work. Again, that's Amanda K, K-A-Y, memories.com. All right, let's jump into that conversation that we had with Andrea Smartin when she came over to her office to share her story. Thank you so much for listening. Enjoy. If you had less than 30 seconds to tell to tell us about yourself, what would you tell us you were about or what you did? What's your value prop as a human? <laughs> well, okay. So officially, I'm a journalist and podcast producer. I recently went through an exercise, kind of an artist statement. And so this is what I came up with for how I describe myself. I'm an empathy engine. So I listen and I uh, create stories. And that fills a basic human need for people to be heard and understood. Wow. I like that. I like that. And it's true. I need true to come up because... with something fancy like yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> Why aren't you doing that? I just say, oh, I, do a, po I do a podcast. Do a podcast. <laughs> well, yeah. And with, with the podcast that you do, it's so true. Mm -hmm. They're so fascinating to listen to. <laughs> Thanks. And we're, we're going to get into all of that here in just a minute. Uh, the podcast that you do currently, I like to kind of find out a little bit about the person we're chatting with, where's home, where you grew up, where would you call home at, Andrea? Well, my whole childhood was mostly in upstate New York, Syracuse. Beautiful area up there. Yeah. yeah. Um, went to school in Connecticut. I've lived in Boston. I've lived in Seattle. Um, finally landed in Utah. And I think I'm, we're here permanently. What brought you out here? My husband's job at the University of Utah. He's a, a professor at the U, the physics department. 
And uh, I had never been to Utah when we moved here. It was a completely blind move, completely different from anything I've ever experienced. Oh, so you before. hadn't even visited so. before you moved? We did one quick like weekend visit. Yeah. When my daughter was a baby. What was your initial and reaction? I, you know, I could not get a good sense of it in one weekend. It, it yeah. still felt like a blind move. Like I really didn't know what I was getting into. How long ago, <laughs> how long ago was that that you moved here? About six years ago. So now. you've been here for a minute. Yeah. You've seen yeah, Utah I'm even to it. go through. I mean, I'm sure a lot has changed <laughs> yeah, even in the six, a lot years, has changed in six years that you've it's true. been here. And, uh, you know, I started out as a reporter at KUER pretty quick right after I got here, a job opened up and that just worked out really easily. Um, and that was a great way to explore a place, being a reporter out there with your microphone, talking to people. That's actually like, like probably the best way to get into the area that you live in. Yeah, it's awesome. So what so I, we're going to kind of bounce around a little bit because I'm curious even what got you into radio. But what were you doing for KUER then? You were like a field reporter. Yep, field reporter doing local stories around Utah. Um, we all had our areas of focus. So I did immigration, healthcare, business and labor. So what got you into radio even? Let's, let's back up just a little bit. Like what, did you go to school? So I, I came through the back door kind of, I started working in public radio right out of college, but, uh, that was in 1999 in Boston. And I actually started as a web producer and I had these grand ideas about why I wanted to be a web producer and I wasn't really thinking about radio as a career. I just thought all, so much was happening with the Internet. It was booming. People were hiring people left and right. They just needed someone to do their web website. Whether you had skills or not, I was just learning on the fly. You know, I graduated from college with a double major in English and music. So Where'd you go to school? I didn't know how I was going to oh, get wow. <laughs> um, where, where I went to you? Wesleyan University in Connecticut. Okay, okay. Yeah. Um, so... I was trying to figure it out. But 1999, the web was booming. We didn't know where it was going yet. Right. And I had these ideas like um, that had this great democratizing potential for information. Right. And I wanted to be in on it. And I thought maybe I'll just be a web producer and I'll figure it out. I want to be one of those people that's involved in shaping the way we, you know, what Internet is for our society. So yeah, I was the worried way that it was going to take over by business interests, like big business. And I thought, oh, it's got this great democratizing potential. Like, I want to be involved in this. And then in a way I was right, but I had no idea in what way I was going to be right. Like when you look at it now... <laughs> All the things that are made possible, I mean, like Breitbart News and <laughs> um, the way people are sharing information, it is very democratic in a way, but it's um, it's kind of scary also. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but KUER wasn't yeah. your first radio job. Um, no. So I st so Boston, I was working at WBUR in Boston. That's where I started as web producer. Then we moved to Seattle. And there I was a web producer again, and I eventually realized that I was more interested in what was going on in the radio. I got gotcha. you. Than on the web. So it took me a few years to get to that point. What was I, what was it that that uh, you, that attracted you more to the radio? What was it about the radio? Well, I got my I got to try telling a few stories. I think I had to get over my inhibitions and my idea of myself. I didn't think that I was the journalist type. Uh, I didn't think of myself as an aggressive personality, you know, elbowing people out of the way to the get to the story type journalist. But I started to realize that public radio journalism is different <laughs> and um, and that it uh, different how. Well, so the first radio story I did was about um, children of incarcerated parents. Oh, wow. And you and I wow. went to the prison and I recorded those conversations with his father and his daughter over the phone. You know, she has to call collect basically when she or he calls collect when he wants to talk to her. Yeah. And um, you can get at these really human stories, these insights into people's lives. I got to go into the prison and sort of reveal that for people, what that's like, what it's like for this guy to try to be a parent from prison. And once I started doing stories like that, I said, oh, wow, I could really do this. Like, I can imagine myself, like, working my way into a career and just doing this forever because that's You really loved it. It was, your, it was yeah. your passion. I basically and... fell in love with it how, once I started doing it. How was that for it. you, like, to really approach people? Was that kind of a new thing for you to approach people and be like, I want to share your story? I mean, even if yeah. they or if they didn't want to, how did how did you handle that? Well, 
It's great. Like, it's funny. I think public radio is filled with people like me who are introverts because there's something about having a microphone and it's your job that just opens up possibilities for you. It's like a superpower. It emboldens you to go walk up to anyone and start talking to them. (laughs) There you go. Or or ask them these personal questions, you know, that you might feel uncomfortable asking. Otherwise, it's somehow it's like an excuse to enter that space with people. And once I got sort of comfortable with that and started to own it, I realized there's just an amazing power in that interview space. And maybe you experience it here with your podcast, but it's... Uh, All the time, yeah. You just... uh, it's amazing how people want to tell their stories, even when you think it's going to be painful or um, something that's hard to talk about, right? There's something in us that wants to tell those stories, like it serves a need, right? Absolutely. Yeah. And that's one of the, the things I love about doing this show is finding out how similar we all are, yet the same, mm-hmm. right? We all have different... Uh, we all come from such different backgrounds and have different experiences, but we're all still innately human. Absolutely. And I think people forget that about other people. For the, <laughs> yeah. Don't you think for the most part, yeah. you just, you don't really look at people as with an empathy point of view with them as humans, think about their life story until it really hits, you know, it's really put in your face. Mm-hmm. So I know yeah. you're not any, you don't, you're not in radio any longer right now, correct? Well, I'm not at that job at KUER, K-U- but I still do freelance stories. So I actually do stories for NPR, the national. Oh, really? Um, so if they, there's a story in Utah that would be of national interest, I'll pitch it to them and sometimes they'll take it. I actually just won an award with NPR. One of my stories was part of a package of awards, that, a package of stories that they submitted for an award. How did you get but, in? I mean, how did you get in? Is that because you been in radio previously, like NPR is not going to just hire any Joe Right, because I already had a relationship with them from working in sure. public radio stations. So I, was t- I continue to work with the same editor that I was working with before. And there's another pro- public radio program called The World that I do stories for too. What, what advice would you give somebody who wanted to get into radio? Is it, do you think radio is dying? Do you think it's a career mm. somebody should pursue? I mean, your your honest opinion on radio. Well, I actually think NPR as an organization, if it's public radio folks are interested in, uh, NPR is doing really well. And there is, I mean, you know, respect for journalists in general is sort of plummeted over these past few years. But NPR is still a, a really strong sort of brand that people trust. And I think for good reason. There's a lot of integrity there. So... I think that that realm, that part of radio is doing really well. Um, you're probably your like morning show, FM radio, you know, I'm trying, I'm trying to even the, think of an example, like local radio stations that just play music. That's, that's a whole different world. Yeah. And I don't, I can't tell you much about that. Have you, have of, you done anything with, with that type of, radio. Yeah, public yeah. radio? I've never done that. The, the DJ scene or the. Or so what would you say for somebody yeah. who wanted to get into public radio? Then? Mm-hmm. What, what advice would you give somebody who wanted to get into that field? The hard part about it, and this is a weakness I would say in public radio, is that often you have to kind of intern for free to, to do your time. So I think it kind of self-selects people that can afford to do that, right? You can afford to not get paid or get paid very little. Which for is a little. so <laughs> frustrating because if if you have the the passion and the talent, you just can't afford to work for free. Yeah, yeah. that makes. I mean, difficult. that's been one of my biggest mm-hmm. holdups. Is is yeah. I would, I would love to get on you know regular syndicated radio, but at the same time, I'm not a how many years a kid you living at no home money. and right. and you know no money yeah. so i'm stuck doing a podcast you know <laughs> <laughs> no but you know i mean yeah. we're going to get into that obviously mm-hmm. uh you know you do a podcast but i think podcasting is really the way to go if, for people that want to you know want to do radio yeah it opens up possibilities right it does so, yeah um, it's hard though too mm-hmm. as you've ran right? into it's to get it funded and to to uh, find an audience. There's a lot of work because you have to pick up the slack of a, what a full team would do. Right. If you were on the radio, you know, yeah. and, yeah. and with, with larger podcast um, networks, mm-hmm. you really end up doing and learning. So it's probably a really good thing to try out because you learn a lot. You learn quickly. a lot by doing, right? Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. In all the yeah. years of, of working with public radio, what was the worst thing? Like, was there, <laughs> was there something that you was just like, gosh, I'm so 
glad to not be doing that full time because of that. <laughs> yeah. Is there, is there well, one or two things? I mean, or? this is kind of gets into why I left my job. Um, you know, and it's funny cause I thought I was going to just do it forever. Like when I started my job here in Salt Lake at the radio station, I just thought like, I could do this forever. It's just what I want to do with my life. And you know, I've just, it was a really good match with who I am. And, but at some point after doing it four or five years, suddenly I didn't want to do news anymore. News was like, we had to fill the news hole every day, you know, to a minute and a half story, two minute story. And were there restrictions do on what kind day. of stories that you had to, to bring to the table? It was a little bit self-directed. I often could come up with my own story ideas, um, usually within my areas of, of focus. But, uh, but just having that daily news hole meant that I couldn't get into those stories that were going to take longer or going to take more thought or going to, you know, just, we're going to take more than a day. So why weren't, why weren't <laughs> yeah. they letting you do those stories? Then? Um, I don't know. Just sometimes that news hole starts driving things, you know, and it can kind of depend on the the leadership of the organization. Um, but I, I think, I think for me, it was also a shift where it was like news started to be, it wasn't what I wanted to be doing anymore. I wanted, I had all these interests in sort of the bigger changes that all of us were dealing with, social changes. And I wanted to be, and also I I started to crave a kind of, I wanted wisdom. You know, I wanted to tell and hear stories that were going to help us all sort of find a path forward in all these things that we're struggling with. I mean, I'm thinking about sort of social change, like we're all dealing with changes in gay marriage and sure. gender roles and our, our, you know, our work and home life is changing. And, and it probably um, feels impossible to dig into any of that with a couple right. of minutes. Race issues, immigration, yeah. um, climate change, right? Uh, technological change. That's a big one for me. Like, how do we adapt our lives to, and, and adapt to these changes? That's just so much is happening in our lives. We have to deal with so much. And stories can help us, Right. Oh, absolutely. I mean, they can help us process our experience and think, where are we now? Where do we, where are we come from? Where are we going? And news just was not a big enough. Um, but that's what they wanted you to make, right? Like that. they're and like, that's oh, what we, I was hired to do, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's kind of the job of a reporter is like, what's new today? Right? The, the fun thing but, about stories versus news is that yeah. you can really dig into someone's actual point of view and someone's actual experience. Mm -hmm. And it's hard to share that when you're just trying to be an objective reporter. Yeah. And I did get, I mean, it's something that public radio is actually really good at. I mean, those, some of the, if you get a little more time with your story, there's times when I felt like we were doing it really well. Mm -hmm. It's just not as much as I wanted to be, you know? Um, how, how so I would people... get like these, these little moments where I was like, that's what I want to be doing. Yeah. How many people are over there at KUER? How many how many reporters? Um, it's growing. Uh, I think there might be six reporters now. And they're all doing yeah. news. Um, yeah, there's really? a couple of hosts, like morning hosts and afternoon uh -huh. hosts, and then I guess there's maybe it's so it's actually four sort of full time reporters. I think it would just seem like to me that you know they would want like gosh you pitch some incredible ideas and they would just be like oh my gosh well, run think, with that do it you would think, let's but do it the tricky thing with things like programming and st like the structure that's already in place is that they have it seems like they would have okay we need five minute slot here we need a ten minute slot here and then if you wanted to pitch something, they would have to rearrange everything and it, it, it affects a ton of people. Right. Yeah. So it's harder to like really create different things or new things. It seems like, yeah, it's just that challenge of you've, this is what you've been doing. This is your mission. This is how you fill it. You know, you've got this newsroom, you've got a talk show and you've you got to keep fighting producing that every day. And it's just like, there's this momentum with what you've been doing mm -hmm. and it's, it's hard to make a shift and it's risky, right? Like you kind of have to oh, sort totally. of like think You don't about, know how people will react. Yeah. yeah. Did you have to edit all your own stuff as well? Um, or did they have like audio we had, editors? We had an editor, but I did have to, I put the audio together wow. myself. So yeah. you were pretty much almost like you were creating your own podcast, really. <laughs> it's like kind you, of like you, that. You yeah. had to, I mean, yeah. but yet you were, were not doing what you wanted to do. Mm. So it came along, you're like, wait a minute, I want to do a podcast, right? Like, is that kind of what happened? Yeah. Like, talk about I mean, I, what, what happened it's funny, with it's your never, shift. It's never like I was like, I really want to be a podcaster. It was more like, 
these are the kinds of stories that I wanted to do. And then there was like, at the, at the same time that that was happening, podcasting was just taking off, right? Um, there was, when, when there was, was the phenomenon, phenomena of serial sure, happened, sure. right? It was sort of after the serial and it's just the real podcast boom where suddenly a lot more of America was aware of podcasts, right? Thank goodness for serial, <laughs> right? Yeah, they, I mean, yeah. you know, people make fun of serial. I know uh, a lot of like, was great. Well, mm-hmm. the, the, the thing is the OG podcasters kind of hate serial really, right. to be honest with you. Well, everyone's going to hate whatever well, brings what they've been doing the mainstream. Yeah, it's kind of, well, no, not the mainstream. It's like, oh, all of a sudden everybody's eyes are on them and I've been podcasting for right. 10 That's years. That's what I mean. Yeah. Like, yeah. And so they it does. It makes it hard because you're like, well, what about the rest of us? Right. Well, hey, serial, I've never listened to it. I know we, we <laughs> yeah. tried. Um, but from what I heard, you were it's doing a, it before it was cool. I know. Oh, <laughs> well, no, I mean, I'm not, I'm not, 2012 is when I, when I launched, I am Salt Lake, but, yeah. mm-hmm. but I think that we have to give it credit. Well, without uh-huh. things like that, people yeah. wouldn't know about podcasting. So really, we should be a little bit grateful, even if it's frustrating that people aren't specifically sure. listening to the OG well, podcast. Well, this American <laughs> Life is what got me, you know, I was yeah. listening to that. It was like, what, 2010, 20, early 2011, mm-hmm. probably I was listening to This American Life. And that's what kind of was like, well, shoot, this is kind of cool. Yeah. I've always loved talk radio. Wait, mm-hmm. I could do it myself. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And so you started investigating. Is that kind of what happened? Yeah, so it just sort of opened up the possibility in my mind. My first thought was like, imagine if I could do what I really want to do at the station. And then I just start started letting myself imagine that. And then I started to try to see if there's a way I could do that. And then I eventually just was like, I can't do that and still do my job. Mm-hmm. And so, and I kind of tried to push it and I tried... I, Pose these ideas and it was like oh, there's no space for that right now so i thought oh i guess i could leave and do it you were you, know? you were pitching that is that what you were saying yeah. when there was no space you were kind of pitching yeah it wasn't really an opening for like oh do you want to you know they weren't looking for like do you want to do a podcast you know they weren't now why wouldn't you have stayed at the radio though and still done a podcast which a lot, well, a lot of people because it's a demanding job like i i couldn't do my job and pursue, I, you know, and I have a family, like I, sure. I, it was a choice that I was thinking about. I mean, some people could do that, I yeah, guess, but no. I didn't want, yeah, you didn't want to do I was that. already like not seeing my kid very much and, you know, <laughs> I didn't yeah. want to add to that. So yeah, it was just a choice that I made that, oh, if I want to move forward, I need to step away and, and have it be an experiment. Just like know, really just pursue yeah. what you are f- like really fascinated by. Mm hmm. Let's actually take a quick break here really fast to play a message from our sponsor. And then we're going to get, we haven't even talked about the name of your podcast, Uh (laughs) but I want to hold that for when we get back. I was going to have you tell us, but I'll have it for when we get back from our uh, sponsor break. So hang tight. This episode of I Am Salt Lake Podcast is proudly sponsored by Jed's Barbershop. With three locations, you have no reason to not always look your best. Go get a haircut, a beard trim, or even a straight razor shave. Jed's Barbershop is open seven days a week, Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. to 9 p.m., Saturday, 9 to 7, and Sunday, 12 to 5. Their newest location is located at 167 East, 900 South, right next to Randy's Records. They also have a location downtown at 212 South, 700 East, and up in Sugar House at 2153 East, 2100 South. No appointment is necessary. Just show up, get yourself a haircut. Maybe you have a uh, last-minute date or a job interview. Jed's Barbershop is the place for you. Head on over to their website at jedsbarbershop.com for more information. So the name of your podcast, what, what is the name, name of your podcast for people listening? Mm-hmm. It's called Changing Our Stories. The idea is it's personal stories of transformation. So each episode is an exploration of how people make meaningful change in their lives. When did you release the first episode? Like how long ago was it? 
It was in January. January of this year, 2017. Mm-hmm. Yeah. How long, like, did you teach yourself podcasting or did you find it to be pretty natural since you were already doing stuff with radio? Yeah, the the putting together of the audio stories, uh, I kind of already had a lot of those skills. Um, but so I just had to sort of learn the, the mechanics of how one puts out a podcast and gets on iTunes and all those things. So I just talk to people and talk to people who've done it before, basically. Did well, you have to get familiarized with the equipment? Uh, like go find your own equipment? And a little bit. I works? had to get some of my own equipment because, yeah, I... I was, I've always been at a station. So yeah. I was, I was, that's what I was curious. Everything. Like how, I mean, I would imagine you use pretty mm. similar recording equipment, right? I or? keep it really pared down. I mean, I, all I, I've just got this little recording kit that I use out in the field. And then I got a special mic for recording myself when I do my narration. And then I, but I actually just use my recording kit with that too. So it's really, what really is the recording simple. Kit and then just use? digital um, audio editing on my laptop. Oh, I'm going to forget. I oh, it's all, it's all good. The, I was just curious. The, I'm kind of an audio specs. nerd like that. I was just kind of curious. The Tascam? Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah Tascam mm-hmm. portable yeah. recorder. Yeah. What I'm what I'm curious, and, and, and I'm more or less trying to even emphasize this, because I, I think a lot of people don't realize how much time goes into creating a podcast. Mm, yeah. You know, a lot of people just think you go and record it. Mm-hmm. And it's done. Your average episodes, I mean, they're not long, right? What right. would you say? They're under 20 minutes? Right. Or, mm-hmm. or how long are most yeah, of your episodes? Yeah, between 10 and 20 minutes. And how long does that take you to record or to put together? Well, it's the putting together. I mean, the recording doesn't necessarily take that long, but um, I'm doing the whole like this American lifestyle storytelling, yeah. right? So it's, some, it's out in the field and it's... Um, uh, it's highly edited, and then I write my whole narration around it, and then I mix that in. So it's like a sometimes a week to produce a ten to twenty minute show. And see, to me, I find that, that so fascinating. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, I talk to people all the time, and they're like, "Oh, I want to do this narrative show, like you know, This American Life, and this and that." And they don't realize a lot of those have like you know they employ. 10, 20, 30, 40 people yeah. to do one podcast. Mm-hmm. And then it's like, then you wonder why awesome shows. And, I, and I'm serious and I'm not just saying this. I mean, your podcast is a phenomenal listen. Mm-hmm. Oh, it really is. It, like, it, I'm a huge it, it, criminal this American yeah. life. Like, and it just falls right into those. Wow. Thank you. It's so No, good. And, 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 it, and it makes me sad that more people don't even know about it, mm-hmm. right? Like yeah, me well, too. No, no, and, and I know that, and, 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 and you know, I could sit here all day long. And I mean, I'm going to tell all all the listeners of of I am Salt Lake, please go check it out. But like, even uh, you know, we started a podcast Salt Lake group, and I know you posted it on it, and a few people are like, "Whoa, this is crazy!" And I'm like, "Yeah, it's been." There. But you know, I, I'm, I'm guilty. I didn't know about it either. Mm. What have you found to be the biggest struggle? With doing a podcast. Well, just what you said. How do you get the word out there that it exists, right? I mean, I my favorite part is making the content right. And I put my heart and soul into it. And like you said, it's like super time consuming this the style of podcast that I'm doing. And then but I know nothing about marketing or how one gets these things out there. And and I've always been able to rely, you know, I used to be, I produced stories and they would just go out on the radio station that I worked for. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I never had to worry about that part. So, um, yeah, that's definitely the, the big challenge for me to figure out. Have you, have you thought about like outsourcing any of the editing or stuff, or is it just all expenses? Is that kind of what's held you back from, from hiring somebody to do oh, all that? The editing, I like doing it myself. Sure. Like it's, a, it's all very personal for me. Like it's all part of this very personal process. Like I, that part I kind of want to keep to myself, but the, I would love to have a platform where people could find out about my podcast, you know, that exists or that other people are doing that work. <laughs> what, what, do you mean, there, what do you mean? You know? Like a platform? Um, like a- well, there are, you know, there's like podcast networks, you know, Radiotopia is sure. one of oh, them. Yeah. Sure. Um, where people know they can go to this network basically and find a podcast that's really good. You but know? see, okay, so here, yeah. you know, let's let's talk about this because I mm-hmm. see this online. I'm in a lot of podcast groups, yeah, and they talk about, oh, are you in a network? 
So do you really go and look at those networks and all the podcasts that are? I've never done that. I've never. I really haven't either. I, I, and I've I always wondered, like, what's shows. the purpose of a network in that way? Like, yeah. I've never. That's true. Gone I guess, to I like guess the way I radio find them is, I mean, often the podcasts that I love come from public radio. So I hear about them that way. And then otherwise it's like friends or word of mouth, right? See, yeah. I just get on iTunes and search. Really? Do you? Like, just like, random like search? subjects I, and. Yeah, he's really experimental, though. I don't think most people are that experimental <laughs> well, with new listening. Well, you know, I, I, I probably, I probably will listen to about twenty to thirty new podcasts a week. Wow! Mm-hmm. And then unsubscribe. And I get really That's more than me. Like, I thought I had a lot on my phone. <laughs> oh, I, I, when I was, when before I got married, I was probably subscribed up to ninety podcasts. Mm. <laughs> yeah, you, you know? need a lot yeah. more time back then. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> but, but and, and I, I find myself like really. And I think a lot of people might be kind of fall in the same category as me, where you get really attached to a style of podcast and to the host. Mm -hmm. And then even if like there's a whole bunch of other quote unquote great ones on their network, it's just like, yeah, but it's just not the same. You know what you want. You know, it's not who I'm used to. What did what did your like um, what did people at KUR say when you say you wanted to leave to do a podcast? What was I mean, did anybody say there had to be something? People said, did they think you were crazy? Uh, people said, I admire you. You're brave. But some folks said that. Yeah. Um, I bet deep down they were super jealous because they're like, I, <laughs> who doesn't want to just go pursue a dream? You yeah. Know? Yeah. Do you regret leaving the radio and, and doing your podcast? Um, I struggled with it a lot and I think it was the right decision. But I, I did have a lot of sort of second guessing, like, was there a way I could have stayed? Did I could I have done something different? But I think sometimes you just have to make a move to to try, you know, to open up the possibilities for something new. And I um, I could end up back there like I'm not there's a lot of the, the possibilities are pretty wide open right now. So I'm um, it's no regrets. I'm just still figuring it out. You know, what made you decide to like do seasons versus just an episode every week or every uh-huh. two weeks, like like the average podcaster? Well, it's the, some of the public radio podcasts do that. Like one of my favorite ones is Invisibilia mm-hmm. out of Ooh, NPR. Yeah. And they do seasons and there's kind of this long wait in between seasons. And I and when I'm listening to that show, I kind of stretch it out because I don't want it to end, you know. And they talk about like a time consuming type podcast. I mean, I'm sure I think they put a lot of work and time into those episodes and they're super meaningful, like life changing for for me. Um, I guess that's kind of the model that I'm working for working on is that it's for me, it takes this all this energy and thought it, it's like this like churning in me when I'm working on it. And um, at least in the second season, there was a kind of a theme that held all the stories together. So I wanted to do all those together. And also, this is like an experiment for me. And I'm learning as I go along. So I'm sort of taking a pause after a season and saying, Okay, how did that work? you know, do I want to do it differently next time or, you know, how big of a pause are you doing? Well, right now I'm doing a bigger, a bigger pause because I'm trying to figure out how to move forward in terms of how do I get more reach and how do I fund myself doing this? So, so those are the big questions I'm trying to tackle. So I'm, and I'm also, I'm, I've got, I'm churning with the ideas about what the next season is going to be. And I am thinking about the idea of just keeping it going continuously, like on some regular schedule, yeah. maybe every other week. And how but many in, episodes were in the first season? Um, first season was seven episodes. So so right now, if you go on to uh, iTunes, there would be seven episodes. There's right? seven in the first season, and then I did a second season, that's gotcha. six. Yeah. And the second season's not out yet, right? This, it's out, yeah. Oh, oh so there's yeah. two, se- two seasons reason, completed. And then, I was, yeah, I was going to yeah. say, I thought there was more than seven episodes. Yeah, 13 altogether. Yeah, yeah. okay, okay, <laughs> I'm following now. Yeah. Because my biggest fear with doing a season is is I would always say, you know, people forget about you, right? And yeah. then unsubscribe, and then you mm-hmm. come back, and I don't know, that's all But I kind of like your, I like the talk. inside of how you could take a little bit of time off after the season and mm-hmm. reassess 
Oh, yeah. your, your creative process. I even. would love, and that I is, actually I did really that with this podcast. I took about six months off, and it is great to just kind of recoup the mind and 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 yeah. readjust. And but then and, you had to recover your audience. Did you find that? Well, or? yeah, it was mm-hmm. it was it was tough because I noticed my my listeners. It took a while to get it kind of back up to speed, mm-hmm. and that was that was kind of the biggest regret I had with with taking time off. Uh, I originally I didn't. I thought I was just going to take a few weeks off and then a few weeks turned into a few months. Mm-hmm. And then people, I, I got a few offers. People wanted to buy the podcast. I'm like, no, it's not for sale. Uh-huh. Uh, I'm going to keep doing it. So hmm. that was what kept me uh, to kind of get back and in, in doing the show. Mm-hmm. Um, it takes time though. I mean, I'll tell it, uh, you know, it, 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 especially some of your first episodes, you mm-hmm. know, it's like, gosh, they just don't get listened to as much as, the, the, later the later stuff, ones. but, uh, yeah. what do you know now that you wished mm-hmm. you would have known when you started all of this? Yeah. I think I had to go through this doing it on my own thing to figure out what was important to me and to start to get an understanding of what the compromises might be or my, how I might need to shift things if I were to work with an existing organization. And I'm, I'm still figuring it out as I go, but I, I think I just had to work through that. So the name of your podcast, Changing Our Stories, right? Found on all the podcast outlets. People can find, what, do you have a website for people to check out too for it? Yes, it's changingourstories.org. And the next season, you're kind of still uncertain on when that's going to be out? It'll, it should be out before the end of this year, but I'm still figuring out if there might be partners involved. What would you say, like for, what would you say some of your stories are about? on there. What would you just kind of, cause I know you were, you kind of gave a little bit about with the podcast, but what are some of the stories on the podcast about? Yeah. Um, it, it comes out of the gate looking at how, you know, it, it, my very first, uh, episode came out in January, which is right around the inauguration of Donald Trump. So that was on a lot of people's minds. And we were, I think a lot of awareness that the, we are a sort of divided country. It's a lot of talk about how divided we are. And so the first episode is about what happens when we come together. Um, and I, I look at one woman who's, um, who houses these uh, exchange students from Saudi Arabia in her house, these young Muslim men, and what how that changes her view. And we, so we have a dinner together. And then um, we look at a, a Mormon and a non-Mormon guy who have – sort of crossed a divide together, this religious divide where they've, they've always been sort of separate and they, they find a way to, um, they say at the end that I love him like a brother now. And so there's, so it's looking at how, how we cross these divides with each other. And I think a theme that when I look back at all the episodes is I'm almost not even conscious of it, but there's this theme I would say of how do we belong together? How do we overcome isolation? What brings us together? Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. Very cool. Definitely check it out. Oh yeah. Let's kind of switch gears a little bit. You know, I want to find out a little bit more about you as a person to kind of even connect with you, and then hopefully bring it all back in uh, to to the podcast. But most memorable concert or sporting event? Do you have like a like a like a concert or or something that's Stuck out a little bit more. For some reason, I imagine you've been to some pretty awesome <laughs> concerts. I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. I, you know, it's funny. I don't go to a lot of concerts, but I'm in a band myself. <laughs> You're in, are you in a band right now? <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. What do you you play? Inst- what do you play? I play the clarinet. Really? And uh, the accordion a little bit. So uh, the band that I'm in now is made up of mostly Russians. <laughs> really? <laughs> Like actual and Russians, it's like, like with the accents and everything. It's really hard to explain this band. It's like a Russian Jewish tango band here, 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 wow. in, here in Salt Lake. Yeah, mm-hmm. really. Can people come see you? Uh, yeah, we. She's like, I don't want anybody to <laughs> even know about this. A lot of what we've been doing, like private parties lately, like things with the Russian community, or we play for tango dances. Okay, like there's a event at Brighton every year, this tango festival, and we've been playing for them every year up in the mountains. Um, and the Russian community here is ridiculous. I mean, there's a yeah. lot of Russians And here. there's this See, crossover I, with the Russian tango community, which I never realized until wow. I was in this band. You've infiltrated the <laughs> Russian how, tango how community. How did you even get mixed up with this band? 
Zumba class. Zumba class. <laughs> All right. Well, there, yeah, I, I guess I need to start going to, to Zumba. Yeah. 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 I was, you know, I had sort of, I was a musician before I came to Utah and I had kind of given up that I just thought there's no way I'm going to find the people that are into the weird music that I'm into in Utah. Because I was living in Boston before, you know, so I did tango music and klezmer music and all these things. And I thought, well, I'm in Utah now and I'm a mom, so I can just forget about the <laughs> music thing. <laughs> and, oh, it's um, so sad. <laughs> just get a minivan. It's over. Just give right? up. And then I was at Zumba and I met this woman and she was talking about going to tango dances. And I said, are there tango musicians around here? And she said, wait, what do you play? And it turned out she's the singer of this band that kind of already existed. And I just joined up with them. But that is so cool. And what, what, what was the name of it you said? It's called Phonograph Blue. Is there like a Facebook page or a website? Probably if I Google it, I, I bet you can find some. we have a website now. Okay. Because I'm going to put that on the show da- notes for mate. this. So yeah. people listening yeah. can go check this yeah, out. I mean, this, send you this a link, is yeah. and so the clarinet. Mm-hmm. Said, do you play any other instruments? A um, little bit of accordion and piano. Accordion. But, yeah. Wow. Just Self-taught? Cool ones. Take lessons? Yeah. Or? Well, I grew up playing piano all my life, but that, so the accordion is something that happened in my adult life. I got one on eBay for a hundred dollars and just started to Did you just teach squeeze yourself? it and figure it out. Yeah. Oh, no. <laughs> I just love accordion music. And I found as a clarinet player, I kept trying to play with accordion players. And finally I was like, I should just learn to play accordion. If you, got, if you want it done right, you just have to do it yourself. Just get an accordion uh, on eBay. If I love it so much. Not, yeah. That's awesome. If you could go back to your first day of high school and give yourself advice, what would you tell yourself? Uh, I would tell myself not to be so, so hard on myself. Yeah. Not, not to, um, you can't have everything figured out before you do it. I like that. <laughs> that who, who would good. you most like to be stuck in an elevator with? Krista Tippett. Krista she Tippett. She is the host of a podcast, actually, called On Being. On Being. I've never listened to that. I one. haven't That's either. That's one of my favorites. But I won't try it out now. I actually, I'm hoping, I applied to go to a conference that she's organizing. I'm hoping I get a chance to meet her. Yeah. What app do you use on uh, use most on your phone? I, th- I would say my podcast app is up there. I don't know if it's the most, but... Do you just use the native? Like, do you have an use, iPhone? Yeah, I just not? use the native one, yeah, on the iPhone. Yeah. Mm-hmm. If you could shop for free at one store, which one would you choose? Oh, just like... Any store. Just load yeah. up on... <laughs> yeah, you, you, the rest of your life, you could shop for free. <laughs> It's all hypothetical. I'm not really going to let you shop for free here. We don't have the funds to make that happen in reality, so... You didn't know what you were getting by coming on this podcast, did you? Yeah, I just have not thought about that. Um, I would, like, pay someone to shop for me so I wouldn't have to shop. Ooh, I I love that idea. (laughs) Is personal shopper an option? It is is now. That's the first time we've gotten that response. If someone was visiting Salt Lake City for a weekend... What would you tell them to do or check out? They're like, I'm coming into town this upcoming weekend. What would you say? You got to do this. I don't know. I feel like all the things we do are sort of, they're not so much tourist things as like just. Well, but, but that's, a, that's the thing is we give the best advice, right? <laughs> because yeah, you're the insider yeah, scoop. Yeah, the insider uh-huh. scoop. So I live just near the 15th and 15th area. So I'd probably send them to... Maza for dinner, and we have a new gelato place in our neighborhood called Sweetily. Ooh, that sounds mm. good. And um, local, and it's like authentic Italian. If they're staying with me, they can just walk right there. <laughs> are you are you looking forward to winter, or are you dreading it? You got you got both mm. types of people here in Utah, yeah. right? Both. At this point, I'm looking forward to it. Are you, do yeah. you get out and ski yeah. and take advantage of I all that? I do like to. I like to cross country ski. Actually, I've always yeah. kind of wanted Ooh. to secretly try cross country. We should. Ski. It's actually really fun. Is it? Have you you've mm-hmm. done I've it? I've done cross country. Well, that seems like a like a Wisconsin thing. Yeah, That's but I didn't Chrissy do it until I came out here. Oh, really? Yeah, but yeah, I grew up in Wisconsin, so the winters out here are nice and mild, in my yeah. opinion. Any other uh, favorite local eating spots? You mentioned Maza. Uh-huh. Any other places you like to eat at? Provisions. I just tried Eclectic. That was really good. Eclectic. And Takashi. Good, yeah. good. I food. never thought I was, I thought, you know, when I moved to Utah, I thought 
I don't know if I should be eating sushi in Utah if that's, you know, well, you and I used to live coast, in Seattle right? too, right? Yeah. So that was really good sushi, but the, I really like Takashi. The thing is, yeah. is what I heard is because of the direct flights mm-hmm. into Salt Lake City, we can get seafood really fresh here. Oh, mm-hmm. is that that's, really? That's what I've heard. Yeah. Huh. And I believe it, you know, yeah. just because. We do have good sushi yeah. here. Yeah. Which is surprising given that there, we're not on a coast. But If a listener wanted to get in touch with you. What would be the best ways? Like, what are your outlets? Let's, let's run down all the websites yeah, and, yeah. And, and contact um, information. Changingourstories.org is the website. And there, there's a way to contact me on the website. You can subscribe to a newsletter if you want to get updates. Um, you can listen to all the episodes there um, or find out, you know, all the places where we are on iTunes and Stitcher and Google Play. I'm on Facebook at Changing Our Stories. Uh, on Twitter at Utah Podcaster. And I'll put all those links at IamSaltLake.com uh, with the show notes for this episode. And I highly recommend everybody listening. Go check out and, and, and don't just listen to one episode. Go go at least listen to two or three before you give it a full review. But see, I, I think just well, I got, one. I got hooked I got on hooked the first on one. one. I got hooked on the <laughs> yeah. first one too. But I always tell that to people. You, you got to give everything Give chance. every podcast a few, a few, uh, few listens, a few episodes. And uh, check it out. What would you name the autobiography of your life? <laughs> oh, my gosh. That's a hard question. Um, professional listener. I like it. <laughs> we'll end it there. Thank you so much, Andrea. <laughs> Thank you. And I always tell people, let's catch up down the road, right? <laughs> Thank you so much. All right. Many thanks again to Andrea Smartin for coming on the podcast and sharing her story. All the links to get in touch with her and check out her podcast, check out everything she's got going on. You can find that on our website at IamSaltLake.com slash 299. It's for episode 299. Go reach out to her. Send her a message. Connect with her on Facebook. Let her know that you heard her on this episode of the podcast. Hey, you've heard me mention them. You've heard me praise them. Jed's Barbershop is a proud sponsor of this podcast. With three locations, you have no reason to not always look your best. Go get a haircut, a beard trim, even a straight razor shave. Jed's Barbershop is open seven days a week, Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. to 9 p.m., Saturday, 9 to 7, and Sunday, 12 to 5. Their newest third location is opened up. It's uh, located at 167 East, 900 South, right next to Randy's Records. They also have a location right downtown at 212 South, 700 East, and in Sugar House at 2153 East, 2100 South. The best part, Chrissy, you don't need to make an appointment. I know you don't. You can just walk in. Just show up. A uh, little tip, though. Mm-hmm. While you're driving over there, call up, tell them to put your name on the list. Yeah, that way you have a less of a wait when you get there. They were recently voted best in state by City Weekly and KSL. You can head on over to their website at jedsbarbershop.com to find out more about them and get all the information that I just rattled here on the podcast. <laughs> go support them. Go get a haircut yeah. from Jed's because they uh, they help keep this podcast. And if you have a, uh, kids and you take them to the Sugar House location, you, you will have a hard time getting them to leave. I so think that's all, definitely well, the yeah, place I guess to probably go with the Sugar kids. House location. It's a got a pool more. table and a yeah. video game and root beer. Hey, that's going to do it for this episode of the podcast. This week, Chrissy and I are going to challenge you to tell one person about the podcast. Yeah. Just one person. That, and how many friends do you have? You, you know, just need to tell one. Maybe your neighbor, maybe mm-hmm. a family member, maybe it's somebody that you know that's moving to Salt Lake City. Yeah. Or to make the challenge even easier, just share this week's episode or a past week's episode on Facebook or Twitter. Mm-hmm. Really easy to Super hit that easy. share button. And uh, let's kind of, you know, make the audience a little bit bigger. Let's bring yeah. some more people here to the fold. <laughs> So to seek, right? Like bring them on in. Yeah. And especially with all the episodes that we have in the back catalog, there's got to there's be, gotta be something that you love or some person that you think is fascinating that you're happy to share. I think it's the least we can do. I do is too. to ask you to share this podcast with one person. If you do a podcast, maybe mention it on that podcast. Hey, I don't know. But I, that was a challenge for this week, Chrissy. Uh, you guys have a great week. Get out and enjoy the city. Go for a walk in your neighborhood. High five a stranger, and we'll see you on the next episode. And good night, Grammy.